everybody. I want to welcome you to our program today, Preparing for a Sex- Successful Sale of a Business. It should be a wonderful program. Um, I am Michelle Weiss. I am the chair of the tax section. Um, we try to kind of all these wonderful programs every year, and um, we will start having our EC meetings on a more monthly basis. Next month, we'll be meeting on the second Wednesday of the month. If you're interested in joining, please, please reach out to me. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, we also have, I would also like to thank our section sponsor, uh, the firm of Hockman, Salkin, Tasha, Perez. They've been a perennial sponsor of the section, and we want to thank them for um, their sponsorship. And with that, I'm going to uh, pass it along to LaVon, who will introduce our program today. Thank you, Michelle. Hello, everyone, um, and welcome to the Beverly Hills Bar Association program, preparing for a successful sale of a business. My name is LaVon Lawson, and I will be the moderator of this program, and I have the pleasure of introducing our speakers. Before I do so, a few comments. You should have received today an email with a link to the materials. If you did not, do not to worry. There will be a link to the materials of the chat function as well. An MCLE certificate will go out soon after the program. A quick note about questions. Questions are welcome. Uh, and feel free to submit them throughout. Please note that we will have a Q&A section, which will be toward the end of the program, which is when most of the um, questions will be answered. So with that, let's turn to the speakers. We have Ken Lohr. Ken Lohr is a senior partner and chair of the business and corporate law department of the firm Irvin Cohen and Jessup. Ken represents entrepreneurs and their businesses from startups to emerging companies to long established businesses. His expertise includes business law, forming and reorganizing companies, equity and debt financing, technology and trademark licensing, mergers and acquisitions, and more. Mergers and acquisitions form a significant part of Ken's practice. Welcome, Ken. Thank you. Yeah, Leighton Pace. Leighton Pace is a tax and business attorney with his own firm, where he provides tax and related legal advice to sophisticated business and real estate clients, fiduciaries, and law and accounting firms of various sizes with complex transactions, structuring, and tax controversy needs. His clients range throughout California and conduct a wide variety of business activities and include non-residents. In the planning area, Layton's legal services include drafting, reviewing, and revision of purchase and sale and merger and reorganization documents, also partnership and limited liability agreements, shareholder agreements, and other similar documents. Welcome, Layton. Thank you. Finally, we have David Bonroy. David Bonrui is Managing Director of Calabasas Capital. He has over 20 years of investment banking and private equity experience. He began his investment banking career at Merrill Lynch in New York in the mid-1990s. He later worked in private equity and venture capital for Union Bank Cal Equities, where he co-managed a portfolio of private equity investments and metal market companies in a wide range of injuries, assuming industries, not injuries. David also founded a financial consulting firm, Blue Line Capital, and he previously spent approximately two years as a VP with a real estate private equity firm. So between the three of them, we have a broad and varied range of experiences. Welcome, David. Um, I think that we will start with you. Great. Thank you, Levon. I appreciate the introduction and uh, happy to be involved uh, with with this program for Beverly Hills Bar Association. So I'm gonna talk briefly about maximizing the value of a business in advance of a sale. So oftentimes when we meet a company, they have no idea what their business is worth or maybe at the country club, a friend of theirs sold their business for X amount and they say, oh, well, maybe I can get that amount. And so oftentimes the conversation starts with what's the preparation needed in advance? And really the preparation can never start soon enough. You know, there's there's an old saying that says, operate your business as though it's always for sale or it can be acquired at any moment. And what that means is having your, your, your ducks in a row, having everything in order. And we sort of categorize it in four areas, business, financial, legal, and, and other miscellaneous. So business first and foremost is, you have to have a clear business plan. You you need a clear growth strategy for your business. You should have a succession plan. You wanna mitigate key man risk. What does that mean? Oftentimes the businesses we deal with, all if not 
a significant amount of value of the business is tied up in that one individual, that one founder. And if you really want to maximize the value, that value needs to be dispersed amongst others on the management team. You should have a very good understanding of what your market is, your competitive landscape. If you don't, you might want to consider commissioning an industry study because buyers are going to expect you to know exactly where you sit in the, in the food chain, so to speak, of your industry. And just saying, I don't know, or I'm the best, doesn't really um, cut it. The next one is not easy to fix if there's a concern, uh, if there's an issue. So you don't, companies that have significant customer concentration have, limit, have, have limits to the, the valuation of their business. What does that mean? So if you have a customer that's greater than 20% of your business, then that's considered customer concentration. If you have half of your business tied up in just three or four customers, that's considered customer concentration. So that increases the risk to a buyer because if you lose one of those customers, you just lost you know, 20% of your business. So companies you know, that have customer concentration really need to try to work on, um, on diluting that concentration, ideally by getting more new customers um, rather than decreasing their business with existing customers, but sometimes Decreasing business with existing customers makes sense if it's if the margins you're generating on it are not attractive. You also want to make sure that your facilities, this primarily refers to manufacturing or distribution businesses, not as much business services if it's basically an office. But if you have a, a, a warehouse or a manufacturing plant, you want to make sure it's in very good shape, that it's it can be shown. And, you know, machinery is not looking like it's breaking down. You don't want it to be a mess um, that maybe it's, it's stating the obvious, but it, it's very important. On the financial side of things, you need to make sure your financial statements are in good shape. And most people don't really, well, not most, some, some business owners don't understand what that means. They think if they have a tax return, they're all set or if they have you know, financial statements with a CPA's name at the top, then, then that's gonna suffice. You really need a qualified CPA, someone who has experience in M&A transactions to, uh, to prepare your financial statements. They should be in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. There's always some exceptions, but in general, they should be gap. Uh, you, you, know, you shouldn't use a mix of cash basis and accrual basis, because that's, that's gonna be, you get, you know, buyer's going to have to fix all that during due diligence. And you don't want that to happen. You want to fix all of this before buyer starts looking at it. Oftentimes it makes sense to commission what's called the quality of earnings. And it's kind of like a mini audit that a CPA firm will come and do and identify any issues and mitigate those concerns well in advance of starting a process. You want to know what the um, what the warts are in your financials before a buyer looks at them so that you have a chance to fix those problems. And a QV is a perfect opportunity to do that. You'll notice that part of preparation is investing. And it does take an investment on the part of a business owner to prepare their business for sale. Clearly, it's worth it if you can increase the profitability of the business and, and make, just make it more attractive from the the characteristics that I uh, just discussed. You wanna make sure you're in compliance with all federal and state tax regulations. Sometimes companies are not uh, totally in compliance with state tax regulations all over the country. They, they may have nexus in certain states that they're not aware of or they're, they're just ignoring. Um, trust me, if that's the case, a buyer will find out about it. You should assume a buyer is gonna find out about everything. Um, and you should, you should disclose everything anyway, because it's just going to cause problems down the road and then create business for, um, some of you litigators out there. Speaking of legal, you want to make sure your legal house is in order. Uh, maybe that sounds obvious, but 
a lot of times companies don't have all their documents that they should have corporate documents for example um, sometimes an s corporation's election document is uh, is not signed or their spouse didn't sign it um, i'm not a I'm not a lawyer, so um, I'm not going to give legal advice, but these are just some examples that I've seen. Um, oftentimes, contracts with customers or vendors have either only one signature or, or, or zero signatures, and it could be a document that, that both parties have been operating under for years and never realized that neither that, that there was an issue with the actual signatures. So um, this is all going to come out during due diligence, so you might as well clean it up in advance. Uh, Goes without saying, you want to resolve any uh, litigation. Um, the only exception I would say, uh, the unfortunate instance that you're a California company, you probably have um, at some point had employee litigation, wage and hour claims. Um, that's kind of an exception as long as it's nothing significant, and you know that, that would be okay. But anything else um, should be settled. Uh, you want to make sure that if you're telling people you have patents and copyrights that you actually do and that you have documentation for other things you know make sure you you know uh, you know you keep track of your insurance policies and um, you keep track of your loss runs um, the other thing i would say on the legal which a lot of people uh, neglect to do is you should do a ucc search on your business see who out there has liens against your company because a buyer's going to do it and you might as well know because oftentimes a company has paid off a loan or paid off a lease but um, it still shows up on their ucc report and you need to be able to have time to rectify that and clean up you know any liens on your business before you sell the business and then finally uh, it may seem obvious but Make sure your website is, is current and looks very professional. Next slide, please. So path to achieving a pr premium valuation. So as you move up the food chain in this, uh, this pyramid, the valuation would go up. And at the bottom of the pyramid is the base. And we, you, know, you could look at the base of, of things that are absolutely necessary, N not, not as much to increase the value, but just to be able to get a deal done. Right, so some of those items I just mentioned, um, if you don't have them, it's 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 often that you won't even get your deal done. So strong financial management and controls, up to date facilities and IT infrastructure, um, you know, good customer references. Um, you know, if, if you've got out stuff out there on the internet that customers and stuff are bad mouthing you, happens often in the restaurant business. You know, make sure you're addressing those. Um, you can't just ignore them. And you have to have a team, right? The value can't be tied up into one person. As you move up the food chain, you know, having a flexible cost structure, uh, having competitive advantages, being able to articulate to a buyer why customers choose you, having a diverse customer base, um, and having a robust pipeline of new products. So with that, you know, talking about pipeline, if you if you go to a buyer and say, okay, today this year we did 20 million, but I'm very positive that next year we're going to do 25 million in revenue, and then our EBITDA is going to go up by 30%. Well, buyers are going to want to know where is that 25 million coming from. You can't just pick it out of the air and say, well, we're we're estimating a certain percentage of growth. Buyers want to see it by customer, by product. Next slide, please. So in terms of a, a budget. Like, again, you can't just say, oh, we're just assuming 20% growth. Buyers want to see where your pro projections are coming from in detail. Revenue by customer, revenue by product, gross margin by customer, gross margin by product. You have to be able to substantiate your financial projections. And by the way, if you don't have financial projections, you need to work on them and get someone to help you work on them because it's extremely important. You know, one of the challenges sometimes businesses, you ask them what they think they're going to do next year, and they say, I don't know, uh, about the same as this year, I guess. Well, that's not going to work if you're trying to sell your business. A buyer's not going to get any comfort from that. Um, you know, you know, and, and if you ask them what they're going to do next month in revenue or profitability, you know, if they say they don't know, then, then 
you got a real problem on your hands and you got to get someone to help you because uh, buyers expect sellers to have visibility. They don't expect you to know what you're going to do in detail two years from now, um, three years from now, but next quarter, next month, you know, within the next six to 12 months, you, you need to be able to demonstrate knowledge with confidence in terms of your business. So having a, a robust you know, financial model um, where you're keeping track of all of these you know, uh, KPIs, so to speak, key performance indicators, um, that's gonna really give a buyer confidence that you know your business and that that's gonna get them confident that the business is solid and attractive for an acquisition. Next slide, please. Addbacks. Well, lo and behold, sometimes business owners don't actually show the true profit of the business on their tax returns and or on their financial statements. Well, in our world, and we deal with companies usually between 10 and 100 million in revenue. So it's, it's definitely the very low end of, of the middle market. Um, so it's very standard to outline and you can't be afraid to outline them. Um, the addbacks. What do I mean? Well, Believe it or not, some people have their spouse or children on the payroll when they're not really working at the company. Uh, I know that may sound as a surprise to a lot of people, but um, the good news is, is those expenses can be added back to demonstrate profitability uh, because a buyer's not gonna be responsible uh, for those expenses. Other things like political contributions, charitable contributions, personal items, uh, personal travel, personal automobiles, um, sometimes you see college tuition or high school tuition buried in the financial somewhere. Um, the more you're honest with your advisor, the better it's going to be because we can demonstrate pro forma profitability by outlining these addbacks. Above market salary, sometimes it's below market, but oftentimes, you know, let's say an owner over $30 million business is taking an $800,000 salary. But if they were to hire someone to run the business for them, the market rate would be 300,000. So that excess amount of 500,000, we would add back to EBITDA um, to show a normal sort of normal profitability of the business because the buyer is gonna you know, use market rates for salaries. Capitalizing uh, versus expensing. So oftentimes companies will um, expense items that could or should be capitalized. They want to expense them to lower their taxes. Um, but oftentimes those items, according to GAAP, should be capitalized. Um, so we can, we can kind of move that item from the P&L of the balance sheet. And if we're moving it from the P&L, that means we're increasing the pro forma EBITDA. Another item that that's folks often don't think of is cost savings. So Let's say in the middle of the year, um, you close a facility and you save yourself 50,000 a month in rent by closing a facility and consolidating facilities. We can pro forma that $50,000 monthly savings back to the beginning of the year. We could show it on an annualized basis. Same thing if you um, let go of some extra overhead, um, you know, we can, we can annualize those cost savings and, and show a a pro forma EBITDA without that item on an annualized basis. And then on pricing. So sometimes a, a, a company is able to increase their pricing in the middle of a year. Um, and we can pro forma that price increase to the full year. And so that those are just some examples. Um, the last one, startup costs. Maybe a business um, starts a new division and or they launch a new product and they incur a couple hundred thousand dollars over the course of 12 months of getting this product completed or starting a new office or facility before any revenue comes in. We can add back those sort of startup costs. I believe that's it. Um, next slide. David, we have about a minute left for this section. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's something I mentioned uh, before, quality yeah. of earnings and market studies. Um, Often, but not always, it does make sense to do a Q of E. Um, you know, depending on how big your company is and how complicated it is, it could be as little as 20,000. It could be 
two hundred thousand. But um, you know, most of the companies we deal with are spending closer to the lower end of that range than the higher end. Um, and it's not always required, but it's often recommended. It just depends on what state your financials are in. And then market study, again, you wanna demonstrate knowledge of your market and the competitive landscape. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, my esteemed colleague, Ken Lohr. Sorry, there was one more slide, just the process. The process of selling a company usually takes about six to nine months. And um, you know it's a very disciplined process with deadlines that uh, that facilitate buyers um, being serious and and I'm not you know we we kind of weed out the tire kickers and it's a competitive process so buyers have to put their best foot forward and act um, you know move efficiently and productively through the process to maximize the value and the outcome for our clients. Thank you. Okay, thanks, David. Uh, next slide, please. So I, um, I'm Ken Luer. I'm a partner at Irvin Cohen and Jessup, and I head up our business and corporate uh, practice group. And in the course of that, I do lots of M&A. Um, I've got about 15 minutes to tell you everything I know about M&A. So either I know very little or I'm going to have to speak very fast. So I'm going to give you the headlines. Um, there should be some time for Q&A at the end of all three of us. And you've got my email address if you want to send an email to me. So to follow up on a theme of David's, one of the things you really want to have in your mindset, um, either as the owner of a business or for the group of you representing an owner who is selling the business is be prepared. Be prepared well in advance of starting the process. And there's going to be several areas that I'm going to focus on. The first is the buyer's due diligence. Now, the buyer, remember, is going to be paying millions of dollars for a business that he knows relatively little about. Um, they are going to send in waves of diligence people. First, there will come the financial and operational people, then the lawyers and the accountants and the experts uh, in various different disciplines. And all of them are going to be turning over um, every stone in the company. They are looking to one verify the value proposition. Are they getting and paying for what they think they're getting and paying for? And two, to identify risks and liabilities. And both of those are areas that can either put your deal in trouble or um, lengthen the process or reduce your purchase price. So even though you've got a letter of intent stating a price, if the buyer finds problems, they may come back to you. You want to be prepared. You want to look at your own company through the eyes of a buyer and be realistic and cold-eyed about it. Um, first, um, your relationships with key customers and suppliers. Are there lurking issues? Can you resolve those before you talk to a buyer? If not, you better be prepared to address them. Um, do you have current contracts with clear terms? As David mentioned, you know, a, lot of, a lot of companies will have contracts with somebody at the beginning of the relationship, and then they just continue even though the contract itself is long but expired. That's fine if you're running your own business, but if you're talking to a buyer, the buyer's going to want to know that there's no disruptions in those lines of customers and supplies. Um, do you have clear title to all your assets? Uh, for instance, intellectual property. Um, sometimes they're in the name of the owner. Sometimes they're in the name of a sister company. Uh, will the buyer sell for a strong license or do you need to transfer those assets into the business that's being sold? Um, protection of intellectual property, okay? In addition to the filings, you'll have a lot of stuff that don't actually have filings, uh, but you consider them trade secrets or otherwise protectable. And do you have strong confidentiality and inventions agreements with your employees to make sure that that can't be taken to some other competitor? Do you use independent contractors, uh, a website developer, a trademark trade logo developer, um, copyrightable materials? The default in copyright law is in the absence of a clear written agreement, to the contrary, those materials belong to the independent contractor. 
you need work for hire agreements, which state expressly that the work you're paying for is owned by the company. If you don't have those for key things, you want to see if you can get them because a buyer is going to care about that. Again, the buyer is paying a lot of money and wants to know they're getting all of the assets intact. Um, do you have some key employees who will be involved in the sale process? Uh, CFO, head of sales, head of operations. If so, consider whether you want to give them retention agreements, meaning that they are getting a bonus on a successful closing of the sale. This locks them in, commits them to the sale throughout the process because you're gonna need their loyalty. Uh, and then finally, uh, is there litigation pending or threatened? Uh, are there disputes that could ripen into something more? Um, do you have any legal compliance areas that you know you've kind of been shortcutting? Um, a buyer is not going to miss those on diligence. They're going to have a very skilled team looking for those things. You want to identify them yourselves, remediate them if you can. And if you can't, you better be prepared to address them. Next slide. Uh, you will need some approvals um, in order to close your sale. Uh, you want to identify those right at the start, okay? Um, for a corporation, you're going to need shareholder and board approval. And um, for an LLC, if there's more than one manager, both managers or three managers or whatever have to be on board. You need th that level of internal approval in order to proceed with the transaction and to close it. Um, Third-party approvals, your lease, um, major contracts with customers and suppliers, other types of contracts probably have provisions that say they can't be assigned without the other party's consent. They may also have change of control provisions that say that the other party has a right to terminate the agreement if there's a change in control. Um, you want to identify those and separate them into two baskets. The ones that the buyer is likely to care about because they're really important and the ones less likely to care about. <clears throat> now, you don't wanna go for those consents very early because you don't want your company to be known as being in play. So you have to dance a delicate dance. You bring it down to where you're confident the deal is gonna close, but you leave yourself enough time to still get those consents. And that's a dialogue at some point you're gonna have with a buyer. Um, governmental approvals. Depending on the industry, you know, healthcare, maybe some kinds of intellectual property, other industries, there may be spe industry specific approvals that you need to get from some governmental agency. Focus on those and figure out what your timing is gonna be and what you're gonna to need to satisfy an agency. Um, if it's a large enough deal, you may have to do a hard Scott Rodino filing. Uh, that's outside the scope of this discussion, but you know that's something your legal counsel can address. Um, let's do the next page. Let's talk about things that are going to come up in negotiation. Well, you've got a letter of intent. The letter of intent says what you're supposed to be paid, the form of consideration, uh, the length of the diligence period, major closing additions. It'll say a variety of important things, but that letter of intent or term sheet is going to be three, four, or five pages long. That's going to be translated into a 40 to 50 page definitive purchase agreement. And that means a lot of negotiation about intricate details. Um, let's talk about earnouts because that's part of a lot of deals. And particularly as David was discussing a deal where maybe a buyer is not completely satisfied on your projections um, and wants you to prove them in fact over time. Um, an earnout is a very complicated negotiation because first question is, what is um, being measured? Is it top line revenues or is it bottom line profit? Okay. What are the targets, number targets for whatever years you're talking about? How long an earn out period? One year, two years, three years? From your point of view, shorter the better. Um, and you want protections against post-closing manipulation. What do I mean by that? Well, let's say that the targets are bottom line profits. You don't want a buyer, a larger buyer, to be allocating an unfair amount of its overhead to your business unit, which depresses the products that are going to be shown for that unit. You don't want that larger buyer to be poaching sales into its 
corresponding divisions, which would tend to reduce the top line. Those are all intricate negotiations. And it's really hard because it's hard to anticipate the things that could come up if you're talking about a one or two or three year down the road burnout period. The next uh, subject, will you stay on as an executive or consultant? Probably, at least for a transition period that the buyer is comfortable with, but do they want you to stay longer? Do you want to? And what are the terms? Um, non-compete, there will be a non-compete. Um, could be typical range anywhere from three to seven years, okay? And not only is the length important, but the scope's important. Let's say you're you know, 50 something, you're selling your business, you've been in this industry all your life, and you may take up a couple of years and think after that you want to start a new business. Well, it's probably going to be in that industry. So you want the scope of the non-compete to be drawn so it gives the buyer fair protection that you're not going to come back in and take away business they've paid for. But at the same time, it lets you to do something new and different within the industry you know. That's something to focus on. Um, the next item are closing conditions. And I, again, recommend focusing on these at the front end so you know what you need to do to prepare for them. Now, one big item in some deals is the buyer will have a condition that they're able to get third-party financing. Needless to say, representing a seller, you do not want this. Um, and if you've got competing buyers and one has this and one doesn't, um, absent some extraordinary circumstances, you want the one that doesn't. You don't want to go through this whole process, get to the end, and find out the buyer doesn't have the money. Um, how long a diligence period does the buyer want? Um, typically 30 to 60 days, but it could be longer. Um, again, from your point of view, the shorter, the better. Um, Third-party consents. Of the ones, of all the contracts you've identified that require consents by their language, which ones really matter? And that's something you can negotiate with a buyer. Do you really have to go to, you know, the person who's providing maintenance services or the alarm service or this, that, or the other thing where getting somebody, you know, in control who's actually going to sign a document without turning it over to their lawyer for weeks um, is probably not worth either your trouble or the buyer's trouble. So you want to identify those in conjunction with the buyer. And finally, um, if you're the owner of a closely held business, you've probably got personal guarantees um, on your lease, on a bank line, maybe on some other things. So you want to make sure that you're able to get released from those guarantees as a condition of closing from your end. Next slide, please. Uh, finally, my final area is uh, risk allocation, okay? Remember, the buyer knows what it can learn in maybe 30 to 60, 90 days, okay? But after they get in there and operate the business, they may find things they couldn't find in diligence. So they're going to care a lot about your representations and warranties. They will go for 15 to 20 pages of the agreement. They will cover every aspect of the company and its business. Hand in hand, the buyer will want indemnifications of breaches of any of those representations and of pre-closing liabilities unless they've expressly agreed to assume it. Okay. So you want that's an important protection for the buyer and potential exposure for you, for your seller. So you will need to negotiate the length of the various types of claims. General claims, probably 12 to 24 months, with 18 being the mean. Um, some fundamental reps, tax liability, employee benefit plans, ERISA. These are big ticket exposure items, and they may not service for a long time. They'll want a longer period, maybe up to the statute of limitations. Um, you negotiate a deductible, typically a half point to 1% of the purchase price that if there are small minor breaches of representations and warranties, you don't get nickel and dime, they don't count. But more importantly is the maximum liability cap. Um, this could be anywhere from maybe a 10% amount of the purchase price. Buyers may push up to 20%. In my mind, that's way too high. That's a hot area of negotiation. Um, 
Again, there will be some types of claims, taxes, employee benefit plans, environmental, that are not limited by that may go up to the full purchase price. Um, the buyer may want a holdback escrow for some percentage of the purchase price. You'd prefer not, and if you've got it, you'd prefer less. And if you've got to have it, you'd prefer shorter, and you'd prefer that's their first recourse, even better their sole recourse, unlikely though. So those are the things to look at if you're representing a seller of a business. Look at them early, look at them before, or you start searching around for buyers, certainly before you open the doors. And now Dave has addressed how to get the best price and the best buyer. I've addressed how to get the best deal terms. And Leighton is now going to address how to keep as much as possible of that purchase price away from the tax mail. Great, thank you so much. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so um, hopefully they saved uh, taxes uh, for the end because it's the best. Um, yeah. As with Ken, um, I've got a condensed internal revenue code down to 15 minutes. Um, so it could be a little difficult. Uh, generally, when it comes to selling a business, uh, there are really two uh, fundamental ways to sell it. One is to sell the assets of the business. The other is to sell the ownership interests um, of the business. So I thought I'd start first with um, selling assets. Uh, that seems to be, um, for a buyer, um, one that is usually uh, pursued first. Uh, so the first thing you have to do is figure out what taxes might apply. I think we all are aware of income taxes. Um, sales and use taxes can be big if you have a lot of tangible property. Uh, property taxes can be an issue. Uh, the other point here is what jurisdictions may tax you. It's, you know, federal government for sure, state of California, but there may be other jurisdictions as well. Um, I recommend to people to at the very beginning, even before the letter of intent stage, to pro forma um, what uh, the tax consequences might be uh, for an asset sale or a stock sale. So you know what to ask for early on in the letter of intent. You also know what you might net, because for a lot of sellers, they don't really care what the price is as much as what do I end up with? What do I get to keep at the end? because that's what they need to know for you know, passing on to other people or to, to live on in retirement. Uh, is it worth it um, for me to go through the process of selling my business? Uh, the second thing that requires a lot of uh, advanced planning is the tax classification of the entity. Uh, this is something that choice of entity has to be looked at when you first start your business. Because sometimes, a lot of times when you're already in a, like a corporate structure, you can't get out of it. Uh, if you're a sole proprietorship or a partnership, you usually have more flexibility to maybe change your status later. Um, but it's, it's incredibly important um, to, when you start a business, figure out how you might actually sell. Is it going to be an ownership interest sale? Is it going to be an, an IPO? Is it going to be, who's going to be the buyer? And, and how are they going to get out of it? Uh, the other thing that is really important here is that the state law entity no longer really tells you what you have. Uh, for instance, a limited liability company can basically be anything. It can be disregarded and treated as a sole proprietorship. It can be treated as a corporation. It can be treated as a corp as a um, as a corporation or treated as a partnership. Um, so, knowing what kind of returns are filed and what kind of elections have been made um, is is very important because it'll drive um, the overall uh, tax hit uh, from the sale transaction. Uh, the next point that's also really critical is what is the type of consideration that's gonna be received um, in, in the transaction? Um, if it's gonna be, if you're a corporation and you're gonna receive equity in the buyer, for instance, that normally says tax-free reorganization. Can I at least in part, um, if I'm gonna get stock of a, of a acquirer, um, can I defer taxes on that? Um, the, the similar concept is if they, they want me to um, or I have to keep some piece, like maybe 10%, 15%, 20% um, interest um, in, the, um, in the buyer or the target, um, how do I go about doing that? Um, so it really is important to know what is the consideration? Is it a note? Is it cash? Is it equity in a buyer? Um, can, can I do a, a, a like kind exchange? Um, the other aspect of it that's really important is 
when, when am I going to sell this? Uh, because as you know, rates can change from year to year. Sometimes you have losses. The losses may expire. Um, the losses may not be able to be carried back. Um, and so you need to, in, in factoring in uh, what the net uh, tax consequences might be, you have to figure, um, you know, what, what is the tax year I'm going to receive these amounts? The other is, you know, installment sales. Can I defer part of my gain um, to later years, maybe when the rates are lower? Um, the other aspect is uh, what is going to be tax rate applicable to the gain or the income? I think it, people know about ordinary income. People know about capital gains. Uh, there is this also 3.8% net investment income tax that applies to um, capital gains and other kinds of passive income. Um, so much of the planning in um, a, a sale, um, a certainly of assets, is what what price what are the total prices being allocated to which assets? Because you don't want them allocated to assets like inventory or um, uh, tangible property that's depreciation recapture, uh, other things that are going to give rise to ordinary income that's going to be taxed at a higher rate. And again, this is where pro forma um, helps a lot. You can figure out um, you know how much are these um, particular asset classes uh, worth of the entire amount. And kind of figure out, you know, if this is the allocation, if that's the allocation, how much will I, will I keep? Uh, the other aspect of it is if you have more than one seller, you know, the buyer doesn't really care that much. I mean, it's 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 like a certain amount of money either way for, for all of the assets. Uh, and so there may be some flexibility to kind of figure out uh, what are the consideration uh, goes to one seller versus another seller um, if you're in control of both, both sellers. Um, next is on uh, the liquidation of the entity, uh, which comes up a lot too. Um, you have this concept of uh, on an asset sale that the company is the one who's actually selling, but then the proceeds um, have to then be distributed or reinvested. That's one of the decisions. What do you do? You haven't gotten rid of the entity. All you've done is gotten rid of the assets that the entity owns. Um, and so there may be things like net operating loss carry forwards um, that, are, that are valuable that you don't want to lose. So you may not want to have the entity go away because it may be essential for uh, uh, deferring future uh, profitability. Um, it's also true in terms of the, um, the year in which you get these amounts. Uh, for instance, uh, S corporations, you've had people buy into them. Um, um, and you sell assets, you have gains, um, you maybe want to liquidate in the same year that you have the gain um, so that you have a gain coming through uh, from the company, but then you have a loss on your equity interest in the company. And if they're both capital, you can offset them. So there's a lot of issue in an asset sale between time, trying to time the recognition of gains at the corporate level uh, with losses that may be um, at the shareholder or owner level. Um, and defecation payments is another, another area where um, a tax person can really help a lot in nego negotiating um, an asset purchase agreement or a stock purchase agreement. Um, these are payments that you may have to pay back for, um, for a breach of warranty or, uh, or representation. You know, things that you thought were okay, but they turned out that there actually are things that you may owe. Um, and so there are really three things that I um, like to do on, on trying to mitigate this. One, if there is some kind of a holdback, uh, some kind of an escrow that the buyer holds back, then um, as long as claims get paid out of that, then and you account for it under installment sell method, then maybe you can um, have um, just less gain in the later year rather than some, some loss that you can't use. Um, second is if you do a deal early in the year, um, then it the, seems like more likely the claims, you know, a lot of claims were going to rise in that year period. So you sell in January, uh, you still have that whole year in order to um, um, have these identification payments be used to, to offset gains you may, may otherwise have. Uh, I think the third uh, aspect that gets forgotten a lot is if you have to make a payment um, to the buyer, 
the buyer may have gotten a tax deduction uh, for the amount that's being indemnified. And so if they have to pay out $1,000 and they can deduct it, what should be the amount the seller has to indemnify the buyer for? Should it be the full thousand or should it be just the amount that um, isn't otherwise um, uh, reduced by the tax savings that the buyer gets for being able to deduct the thousand? And so um, it can actually cut down the amount of identification and payment that the seller may have to make if you get to take into account the tax savings that the buyer may have. I, I think that this is really something that's um, well, a lot of times forgotten in, in documents. I think uh, lastly, from, a, from an asset disposition standpoint, we don't really know what the law is going to be quite yet. Um, it, it, we keep on hoping that we're gonna get more guidance uh, from Congress um, as to what might um, be enacted. Um, the green book that came out in May uh, was just full of various tax proposals. That includes uh, increasing the tax rate on capital gains, for instance, for um, income over a million dollars. That would be dramatic in terms of tax planning um, if capital gains um, were taxed the same as ordinary income rates. Um, it also affect, could affect uh, um, planning uh, with S corporations, um, like kind exchanges. We just don't know quite yet. Um, and so it, it, it has been, this is not new. Uh, we've had similar issues in, in 2017. What's the law going to be? Um, and so you, sometimes you'll want to do deals sooner because you know what the law is. And sometimes um, you, you may want to push it off um, because you don't, you don't know what it's going to be. And so the uncertainty is, is too great. Um, but it is something that we're going to you know, talk to me in, in two months and I'll know a lot better what the law is going to be. So um, from a seller's perspective, usually uh, you want to have um, an owner level transaction. Um, that's because it's simpler. Um, what you have is basically a person selling stock or a person selling the LLC interests or selling the uh, limited partnership interest. Uh, generally, if it's a corporation, you're gonna get capital gain treatment. And so you're usually assured, uh, at least under the current law, uh, the lowest uh, tax rate on it. Um, you also get rid of the entirety of the entity. Um, and so it, it um, uh, some, sometimes it saves you from having to liquidate or deal with other issues. You basically can, can get rid of the, you know, the whole kitchen sink uh, and let the buyer kind of you know, uh, deal with uh, some of the other issues that are there. Um, there are differences here. Again, a partnership, uh, generally you look through and look at the type of assets inside to figure the, the character of the gain. Um, and other issues can happen if you're if all the partners are selling uh, versus just um, one or one or more of um, but f f fewer than all of the partners. Um, entity carryovers is, an is another really big factor in, in this. Um, people like asset buyers like asset purchases because the buyer gets to um, to depreciate and amortize the assets that are acquired. If the buyer um, buys stock, then the assets inside don't get stepped up. And so the buyer effectively can't um, get ongoing tax savings uh, from the purchase price. The buyer generally has to wait for the entity to be sold uh, in order to recover uh, the basis uh, for the purchase price. And so you'll see a lot of tension here uh, where buyers want asset purchases, sellers want um, the sale of uh, ownership interests. And a lot of times there's a, there's a negotiation in between um, as to what does it really cost the buyer uh, to, to get, uh, to have the asset depreciation uh, or lose it. And so you, a lot of times you'll get a, um, some price maybe it's in between um, to reflect um, that the buyer can't fully um, uh, depreciate the purchase price. Um, also, um, if you have lots of carryovers, if you, um, there are certain rules that limit the ability to basically traffic and net operating losses. Um, the 382 rules are the, are the, um, the, 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 the name for that. And so you have to worry about um, when you're selling ownership interests, you have to know what the attributes are. You want to make sure that you're getting value or not destroying value in the entity. Um, the other aspect of selling um, an interest in an entity rather than assets uh, are that 
a lot of times you'll have unwanted um, assets that the buyer doesn't really want to pay for. It's like maybe more than one business or um, or um, investment assets uh, or relics uh, from some prior business. Um, and so you have to figure out how to get those out and that can affect the tax consequences. Um, partnerships are generally better for this because they allow for distributions of property in kind. Uh, if you have a if you have an asset that has value greater than its its uh, tax basis, and that goes out of the corporation, you can have a gain. So you can potentially accelerate gain. Again, it's a timing issue about when would you do this. Um, um, but normally it has to be before the sale occurs. Um, so this is a, a, a big issue um, in, in um, selling ownership interests is figuring out exactly what, what assets are, are going to go along with the company. And that bleeds into the next one, which is the biggest issue for um, um, definitive agreements. Um, that is, um, they, all of the corporate entities or all of the entities' taxes are being bought. You're buying the entire, the, the buyer's buying all of the, um, the interest. So it's buying the 2018 return and 19 return and 20 return. Um, so you have liabilities that are there with respect to that. You may also have refunds uh, because it, it's the entirety of everything that the corporation uh, did and filed. Um, and so it's very important um, to have um, clear terms on uh, what's happening with pre-closing periods, uh, what's happening with periods that where returns are being filed, where part of it's during the time that the, the seller owned it and part of the times where the buyer owned it, um, and what to do on audit and cooperation who has the ability to settle? Because again, if they buy the 2019 return and it gets audited and, this, and the seller is responsible for those tax liabilities, you don't want the buyer to, to resolve um, all the issues with the government. They may say, we give, uh, which would then cause a, a, a tax liability that have to be indemnified for. So you have to work out cooperation uh, clauses um, also, retention of records, you got to be careful of too, uh, because um, as long as there's indemnification um, obligations to the seller, uh, the seller needs to be able to defend themselves. Um, and that a lot of times requires adequate record keeping. Uh, with the indemnification payments, you have the same issue, um, which is that you are trying to time um, any, any amounts you may have to pay with gains that you may have. Um, if you have a big, a big gain in one year and a big loss in a later year, the loss may not be able to be carried back. Um, installment sales, um, escrow holdbacks, um, doing the transaction um, at, the, at the start of the year, those are all ways to uh, reduce that amount. So this is probably the most complicated area, but it happens a lot. Where you, what you have is a stock sale for state law purposes. So it's selling all the stock of the corporation under California law or selling all the uh, LLC membership interests. Um, well, actually in this case, it's um, corporate. Um, and you can't, the buyer can't get the, um, the, the basis step up in the assets, um, but you need to sell stock because you have non-assignable licenses. Um, you have uh, things that just uh, need, you need to have the corporate existence stay in place. You can't just pluck out certain assets and run with that. Um, and so um, there are a couple elections you can make that basically cause what is a stock sale to be taxed um, as an asset sale. And California has this too. And there are other plans to kind of give you know, synthetic um, deemed asset sales, uh, but this happens a lot. And it's really, I'd say kind of more the, um, um, happens more often than not. I, I think probably half of my deals lately have been um, deemed asset sales uh, because it's too hard to otherwise uh, conduct the business if you're just plucking out assets and doing it. Um, so um, in short, um, good record keeping uh, is really important, particularly if you're an S corporation, you need to prove that, you, that you're a valid S corporation. You need to prove basis. Uh, you need to make sure you have all the returns that you filed so you can prove that you filed them so that you can run statute of limitations. Um, you need um, just good um, overall um, 
record record keeping so that the, the diligence issues um, when it comes to negotiating rep representations and warranties in the agreement, um, you can say not a problem, not there, don't have to worry about it. So that's that's the Internal Revenue Code in 15 minutes. <laughs> Layton, thank you. And to all of our uh, panelists, thank you. Uh, you took uh, some incredibly complicated topics and uh, did your best to distill them into something that at least we can take in initially. Almost, you know, almost each item could just spin off a number of different uh, courses. So I wanted to ask, as I think uh, this is kind of an incredible amount of information for someone to take in. So I'm going to ask something actually basic. Uh, you know, David provided a timeline of, as far as what to think about when you're starting to do these deals. So to each of you, kind of where are you in the process? Where do you come in? When do people know when to contact you? And um, you know, how do you build a team? So it's somewhat of an amorphous question, but there's, there's a lot of information here. So, so also, when do people know uh, when you're stepping in? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, usually, we get referred in by either the accountant or attorney involved, sometimes the wealth manager. Um, I guess the the moral of the story is we're very rarely the first ones that they come to. They, they're usually talking to other advisors and they ask for a recommendation. Okay. Yeah, and I'll answer that. Um, <clears throat> when they come to me first, unless it's a small company and they've more or less already reached some kind of a handshake agreement with, with somebody else in their business that's gonna buy them, then it's really a documentation process. But if they're a company that doesn't really know what they're worth, as nobody even has ever been through a sale process before, um, my first step is to recommend um, somebody like David because they really need that front end advice and understanding what buyers may be out there, what buyers are looking for and how to approach it as, as a seller. Um, for my part, you know, if, if I'm coming in later, let's say to go to David first, I want to be in at least at the letter of intent stage. I don't really need to be there through the sifting through buyers or the formal marketing effort. That's David's area of expertise. Um, if they've got questions, I'm happy to try and guide. But the letter of intent stage is when you're first setting out the material terms. And I, I like to be involved in that process. And I'll turn it over to Leighton because I think, you know, even in that process, you know, questions like, is it a stock sale or an asset sale um, should be addressed in the letter of intent. Yeah, I, agree. <clears throat> I, I like to be contacted when you first think you might sell um, because uh, that will um, help a lot. Um, maybe it might even cross a year where you can get certain things done um, in a prior year because you don't want them to show up. I mean, there, there's definitely planning to groom uh, as well as, uh, you know, what would be the fundamental structure of the transaction. And, I, and again, how much are you going to en end up with in your pocket? How much are you going to net after the transaction's over with? And, uh, you know, obviously this is, it's very important that they get you involved. So <laughs> the next, you know, the next course might be kind of like stories of horror stories when people didn't call you in time or did uh, the deal and then contacted you for, you know, for each of you. But so it's, it's incredibly important that people reach you. So, uh, you know, kind of with that, as we're kind of, we're coming to the end of our hour, but I'd love to hear from each of you kind of what, you know, provide all this information, what singular piece of advice would you, you know, would you give us that you think you haven't already told us? Just well, so I, I, I'll go. I know I'll, that I'll, it takes a course. <laughs> I'll, I'll say, look, most entrepreneurs started a company because they didn't want to work for somebody else and they didn't want to follow somebody else's rules. So typically they're not really eager to have a lot of outside advisors and pay for them. Okay. <laughs> and, and probably don't have a big history of that. Okay. But when it comes to preparing their company to sell, this is a one-time event for most of them to maximize the value of what they built up. And this, if nowhere before, is the time to get good advisors 
on all levels and be prepared to spend the time and the money working with them to get the deal you want. Um, that, that would be my advice. Yeah, I'll follow up on that. You know, every dollar you spend on a good advisor, you're going to realize, you know, multiple dollars in, in potential value. So, um, you know, you got to try not to be penny, penny wise and pound foolish. Um, selling a business has some similarities and some differences to selling real estate. So you wouldn't sell your real estate without fixing it up, fixing it up because you want to maximize the value. Same thing with your business. On the other hand, selling a business is much more complicated than selling a piece of real estate. So you have to understand that um, it's not something you want to do without the proper advisors and it's going to take an investment, but it'll pay off. Layton. You took the words out of my mouth. I mean, a good team of people is really important. Uh, an accountant, I think, is incredibly important. A good controller um, is, is really important um, to answer a lot of questions and to help in, you know, gro grooming um, the expectations uh, of both the seller and the buyer. With that, this was excellent. This incredible amount of advice here, uh, very helpful. And it sounds like we, as soon as people are thinking about it, then they should be talking to people like you uh, for a whole host of reasons. And uh, so we wanna thank you. Uh, we in the Beverly Hills Bar Association, thank you. I thank you. And uh, with that, I think that we have uh, completed the program. Well, thank you for having us. Thanks so much. Thank you, Levon.